This episode is brought to you by Tegas. Over the years of our partnership with Tegas, they have evolved from a pure expert network into a full company intelligence platform. Tegas streamlines the investment research process so you can get up to speed and find answers to critical questions on companies faster and more efficiently. The Tegas platform surfaces the hard to get qualitative insights, gives instant access to critical public financial data through BAMSEC, and helps you set up customized expert calls. It's all done on a single modern SaaS platform that offers 360 degree insight into any public or private company. As a listener, you can take Tegas for a free test drive by visiting tegas.co slash Patrick. And until 2023, every Tegas license comes with complimentary access to BAMSEC by Tegas, which makes it easy to search and analyze public company filings and transcripts. This episode is brought to you by Kensho Scribe, the trusted transcription provider for business. If you're not transcribing your audio and video into searchable, usable data, you're missing out. And transcription is faster and easier than you think. Scribe powers call transcription, closed captioning, and more with best-in-class accuracy, speed, and security. It's the chosen transcription service for all of S&P Global, including Cap IQ Pro and clients like leading market intelligence platform Tegas. Scribe accurately transcribes messy, difficult audio, including company and product names, currencies, accents, and numbers. Challenge us with your hardest audio and see how we stack up. Visit scribefreetrial.com to unlock 150 minutes of free transcription today. That's scribefreetrial.com. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Today, we are breaking down Polaroid. For 30 years, Polaroid monopolized the instant photography industry, producing one Nobel caliber breakthrough after another. As their products dazzled, sales grew from just under 1.5 million in 1948 to 1.4 billion in 1978. Today, the business is a shadow of its former self, but the lessons from its history, and especially from the founder, endure. Edwin Land is not the most familiar name in business history, but he has an outsized influence on the world in which we live. In particular, he was Steve Jobs' hero. To break down Polaroid, I'm joined by David Senra, who studies history's greatest entrepreneurs through his founder's podcast. David is uniquely qualified to distill the lessons and secret behind Edwin Land and his life's work, Polaroid. David, well, this will be a breakdown of Polaroid. Mostly it's historical story, not the modern day story that we'll touch on that too. It's also a breakdown of Edwin Land, the person, the entrepreneur, the founder, the leader. I think it's probably appropriate to start with how unique he truly was, because in many ways, everything we do on these podcasts is a study of outliers. We're not studying the normal, we're studying the abnormal. And I think Edwin Land was extremely abnormal in a number of ways. So maybe you can just begin this whole conversation on him and Polaroid by framing just how unique he was as a person. I say almost 300 of History's Greatest Entrepreneurs Founders Podcast so far. I won't shut up about Edwin Land. One of my goals in life is if you're interested in entrepreneurship or doing anything difficult, please, please study this guy. I'm shocked at how so few people know who he was. Why is that important? You know who knew who he was? Steve Jobs. Because Steve Jobs would not shut up about Edwin Land. He called Edwin Land his hero pattern much of what I thought were unique Steve Jobs ideas when I first encountered Steve Jobs and how he built Apple. Turns out, oh, he just literally copied those from Edwin Land building Polaroid. But Steve Jobs, from the time he was 20, called Edwin Land a national treasure and said he was his hero. And then he's dying and he's giving interviews to Walter Isaacson, who writes that biography of him. And he's still talking about the influence Edwin Land had of her. You could argue, most people would say, hey, Steve Jobs, if he's not history's greatest entrepreneur, he's up there. So why the hell is this guy so obsessed with him? That sent me down the rabbit hole. I was like, okay, well, you're talking about this guy all the time. I went and tried to find every single book. And now I've read five books on Edwin Land. I just spent the last two weeks rereading three of them. In the last two weeks, I read another thousand pages on him. I think I've done seven episodes on him. That's how important he is. But I think to give the listener an idea of why he's so special, I just want to read a paragraph that comes from this book. The book's published almost 40 years ago in the 80s. It's a quote 
that the writer, the writer of the book worked for Edwin Land for like 30 years. He's quoting his boss, which was Edwin Land's right-hand man. And it's just fantastic. And he says, why is Polaroid a nutty place? And he says, to start with, it's run by a man who has more brains than anyone has a right to. He doesn't believe anything until he's discovered it and proved it for himself. Because of that, he never looks at things the way you and I do. He has no small talk. He has no preconceived notions. He starts from the beginning with everything. That's why we have a camera that takes pictures and develops them right away, and no one else does or can't. That could lead to the next discussion. Why is Polaroid so important? Me and you were talking Unrelated yesterday, and I told you about my friend John Coogan, who does really in-depth YouTube videos. He's also a two-time YC founder. John is only obsessed with technology companies, technology companies that have some kind of patentable advantage. He texts me the other day. He's like, hey, I'm doing research for a video. What are some good examples of technologies that enjoyed long periods of exclusivity? I was like, oh, shit, that's a really good question. So I go through my entire list. I want to help him as much as I can because I really do enjoy what he's making. And I go through him like most of the people, if they started something that was patentable, other people realize, oh, this is really valuable. Let me have a team of lawyers find like a weakness. Somebody messed up somewhere along. They might have a period of exclusivity for five years, maybe 10 years. I went to it. I was like, it's Edwin Land and Polaroid who had the instant photography field to themselves for three or four decades from mid 1940s to let's say the very early 1980s. He literally built one of the world's greatest technological monopolies. He had this field entirely to himself because he locked up all his patents. So by the time Land dies, the only people that have more patents than he does, I think Land had 535 of them, was Thomas Edison and I forgot the second guy. The crazy thing about that that I was also talking about is that Kodak, who owned the vast majority, Polaroid had like 10% of the entire photography market, but they had basically 100% of the instant photography market. Kodak had the other like 88 to 90%. George Eastman was almost this Rockefeller type person, but he did it just in overall photography. So Kodak's like, oh, okay, we've let you get away with this for multiple decades. We're going to try to jump in here. They jump in. The result of that is this patent infringement case went on for 15 years to get resolved. At the end of that, Polaroid is awarded the largest amount in damages out of any patent infringement case in history. I think it's since been superseded. This is, I think, in the early 1990s. It was like a billion dollars. Not only did he lock it up for 40 years because of his technical brilliance, which he talked about. One thing I think entrepreneurs can learn from Edwin Land, his motto is fantastic. He's like, my motto is deeply personal and it may not apply to anybody else or any other company, but he's like, don't do anything that somebody else can do. When other people like on his board or other managers like, hey, yeah, we're making a lot of money inventing instant photography. Xerox is popping off because Xerox was on the up at this point in history. Let's make a copier or let's make a printer or let's do all this stuff. He's like, we're not diversifying for shit. He had a great analogy. He's like, we're on the 90 yard line. The next closest guy is 30 yards behind and you want me to run around circles. We're not diversifying. We're all in on this. That I think sets it up, which is like, okay, we're dealing with an unusual person. There's all kinds of people. It's like, okay, yeah, you could be super determined and you could be super smart. So let's say you're 100 level determination. There's definitely a ton of people like that. Then there's a ton of people that are like, 100 at a 100 level of intelligence. Edwin Land had both. And he did it from 17 until 70. And he was a fully formed person. He's extremely articulate. He was handsome. He was well-dressed. He could talk to you about art. He talked about history. He did all of the product presentations. The way you think about Edwin Land is, okay, when there's a new product, everybody knows when there's a new Apple product, when Apple was alive, Tim Cook's not getting on stage. It's going to be Steve. Same thing. Edwin Lang gets on stage and he had almost like P.T. Barnum levels of showmanship. The reason I won't shut up about this guy, and I hope people listen to the podcast I made on him and read the books because they're fantastic, is because there's only one him. I haven't come across anybody that's even close to him. Maybe we can rewind to his early days and the kind of personality that he had, maybe even from a very young age, like as a child, and the road to him discovering polarization as an area of technology that he was going to focus on. Because one of the things you and I talked about in our bigger conversation just about entrepreneurship writ large was how strange some of the problems seem that these talented people become obsessed with. And again, polarization, I don't know what it was like back then, but it seems like kind of a random and interesting area of technology or inquiry to be so all in on. Tell us the story of what he was like and how he found this problem before we explore all the ways that he then built on it. He is the inventor of the first synthetic polarizer. His first invention was called Polaroid. It was a product before it was named a company. Literally, he invented the scientific field. I'll talk to you a little bit about his permanent intensity he had from a very young age. 
let me give you an example. People are like, what do you want to be when you grow up? He's like, I want to be the world's greatest scientist and the world's greatest novelist. I've never found anybody that thinks like him. He found what he wanted to do in life really, really early. And he did that intentionally. It wasn't an accident. There's these hilarious stories from when he's young, where he's like six years old. He lived in a house that was supportive, but they didn't have a lot of books. It wasn't like a family of him. His parents come home or like they left him in the other room. He like takes apart every single thing. He goes to great lengths to get his hands on any kind of book that he could possibly read and learn. He is forced to stop studying and stop learning. He's taken to his aunt's house and he's in the back seat screaming. When I grow up, no one will ever tell me what to do. He was that kind of obsessed person. He finds this book. It's by a physicist. His name might be Robert Wood. I don't have it in front of me. It's all about the science of light. What Edwin Land did, he did this catalog, this exhaustive study of science. And he's like, don't do anything that somebody else can do. He's like, okay, I'm not going to jump into a scientific field that somebody else has already dominated. So I need a wide open space that basically I could say, when I'm dead, this is the guy that made that field. He did this exhaustive study and he realized, oh, it's light. The early days of Polaroid from the time he's 17 until he's 70, all the experiments, the way I look about it when I read it, it's like, oh, this is just Polaroid by another name. Sometimes it's individual, his own lab. Let me give you another funny story. He drops out of Harvard twice. The first time he dropped out, he dropped out when he was 17 because he said his fellow classmates were unserious. They were not matching his intensity and his dedication. And that's another thing when you read about him. They talk about his permanent intensity. He's intense. There's a quote I have in front of me. From the first day I met him, he impressed me as a person who lived his life more intensely than the rest of us. That's a quote from his first employee. He was 17. People were still describing him like that at 70. He starts reading this textbook. Textbooks are not fun to read. He says he's sleeping with it under his pillow. He's reading it nightly like our ancestors read the Bible, I think is the quote he used. Religious study. Then he starts doing these experiments. He drops out of Harvard. He's in New York City. He's like, okay, I want to experiment with light. What do I do? By the time he dropped out of Harvard, he had gone to the Harvard Library and read every single book Harvard had on the science of light. So then he goes, okay, got that all down. That's fine. Moving to New York City, gets this tiny little crappy apartment. It's a bed and a lab. That's his whole life. Then he's like, okay, what time does the New York Public Library open? Nine? I'm there at 8.55. He goes through and reads every book on light. And then he's like, okay, now I'm ready to begin my experiments. He gets as far as he can. And then he realizes, hey, I need some equipment. So I think it's Columbia University. This could be in like the 1910s, maybe 1920s is where we are in history. So he's like, okay, I'm trying to run experiments. I don't have a lot of resources. Columbia University does. They're not going to let me in because I don't go to school there. So he waits till they close and then he breaks in every night and he runs his experiments. This is who we're dealing with. He's like 17. What is going on here? That is also something I've seen in the history of entrepreneurship. John Carmack, he went to Juvie for Apple II. Bill Gates and Paul Allen broke into a place to use a computer. George Lucas, when he was a young filmmaker. This is very common. They're not stealing things. I'm just trying to learn and you guys have resources. <laughs> They're so dedicated. They break the law to learn. It's just another level of intensity. It starts just at 17. By 19, he gets his first patent and it's like a giant scientific discovery. He's like a minor celebrity really early. That helps him build his company. He does the patent. He makes the first synthetic polarizer. I've read what polarizers and all this stuff multiple times. I don't even understand it. At a high level, what is it? If you had to simplify it as much as you can. He has a dumbed down version for people like me. And he says his first invention was for like sunglasses. You have glare, you put a polarizer in there, you have less glare. The only stuff that gets through the fence is what light you want to get through the fence. There's a fantastic book called The Instant, The Story of Polaroid, which I think does the best job of comparing Edwin Land and Steve Jobs. The parallels are just so crazy and it's so obvious. And the author spends a lot of time doing that. In there, they have his drawings. It's a really interesting book. But man, that's just not the way my brain works. I felt so dumb reading it. It's simple enough to think about it as the control of light passing through a film or a surface to accomplish other ends, reduce glare. We'll talk about what it does for Polaroid, whatever. But in the simplest sense, that's what a polarizer does. As I understand it. And I'm not like... Not a material scientist. Yeah, exactly. He said leading his company was like leading a bunch of students on a grand scientific adventure. That's how he thought about it. And it just so happens that him, like Edison, because Edison was one of the people he studied, he's like, I only want to make scientific advancements that I could turn to a product because a sale is proof of the utility for other humans. His first thing he wanted to do is a lot of people this time in history were dying at night from driving because there was headlight glare. His polarizer, they would put on windshields and they'd put them on headlights. He's like, hey, all these people are dying. I have a polarizer. I could solve this. We should go convince all the Detroit automakers to adopt my technology. But I want to back up. He goes back to Harvard. His professor is like, okay, I have a bunch of smart kids in Harvard. 
I have one Edwin Land. We need to partner up. His professor is 10 years older than him. He's like, listen, I'll raise money. Let's start our own laboratory, basically a structure so we can just optimize all the talents you have. I'll take care of the money. It was called Land Wheelwright Laboratories. That is Polaroid under a different name. He starts working on that at 19. But what was interesting is, I think his name was George Wheelwright. His partner recognized Edwin Land's genius really early. And then he realized if anybody interacts with this guy, they're going to realize it too. Because his scientific achievement was getting pressed, Land was being recruited by all these giant companies and all these laboratories. There's a hilarious conversation I think will be illustrative to who Edwin Land was this person. They're having this conversation and George is like, all these people are recruiting you. I just put up this money. I don't want you to leave. And Edwin Land's like, yeah, I went to visit them. They opened the laboratory at 8.30. They closed at 4.30. They don't work Saturdays or Sundays. And George is like, yeah, are you going to go work there? And he goes, how would I get anything done? Of course, I'm not going to go work there. When he starts a problem, he hated to stop working. One of the first money into Polaroid actually comes from Kodak. And I think it's a five or $10,000 contract, rather small, but they had an immutable deadline. I tell this story in the podcast where they sign the contract. They have an idea that they can do this for Kodak, but they haven't figured out how to do it yet. It's like an application of a polarizer that Kodak could use for their film. They start working on December 24th. The next time they change their clothes or leave their laboratory, it's January 11th. They're having a conversation and George is like, we have to buy Christmas gifts. We haven't seen our family. Suddenly you take them out of the concentration. He has it. Oh my God, I haven't been home since December 24th. They want a filling contract, but we're just not dealing with a normal person. So when you read about him, to me, it's like, oh, I'm reading about a mixture between an alien and a robot and some kind of super genius. There's one thing that stands out from some of the notes that I reviewed in advance of the call, which is about the often humble beginnings of what turn out to be life-changing projects. The quote specifically was, in a few wretched buildings, although that were wretched, we created a whole new industry with international significance. Maybe touch a little bit on Land's story here and how the scope of ambition can overcome what are humble beginnings, both in his story and just generally for the entrepreneurs you've studied. What he's referencing there is he sets up shop in Cambridge. He's recruiting, obviously, from MIT and Harvard, but he's realized, oh, there's a lot of competition for these people. So he winds up becoming friends with an art history professor that's in the local area. And he's like, I don't need MIT and Harvard graduates. I can take some, but there's obviously competition for me. He's like, I just need people that are genuinely curious and hardworking. Just send me your best students. People thought that was weird. It's like people studying art history. What the hell does that have to do with this industry? Because Edwin Land's whole thing is like, I'm not going to make another product within the industry. I'm going to create an entire new industry. We started in these little small buildings. We created an entire new industry from scratch. We own that industry. Our products have now spread across the entire world. And we did it with people that you think, I think it was like Smith College. I can't remember the name of the college off the top of my head. They weren't tracking the best of the best students. But he's like, I could just take anybody with enthusiasm and a pure love of science and I could teach them how to do it. He thought science, you didn't have to go to college or school. It's just a way of experimentation. When I think about Polaroid, I think about prehistory. To me, the first office of Polaroid isn't even the wretched buildings in Cambridge. It's his tiny little apartment. It's in like a basement in New York City. It's him and one other guy. He's 17 years old. They have to stop their experiments at some point because like there's this huge train that runs by and it throws dust into the windows. They're trying to figure out how to build polarizers. Think about the laboratory that these things are made in now, where he's just like, there's dust being pushed into the outside. And he's like, all right, well, we'll just have to deal with it. That story is as old as time, where you think about, I'm sure a lot of people that listen to this, like, are very interested in the history of technology. Why is there this ethos in the beginning of technology startups? Like, they all start in garages. Go back to the person he influenced. Steve Jobs is just like, okay, mom and dad, we have this contract, come out to the garage, call up our friend Bob, or whatever the case is. When you start a company from the beginning, you're not gonna have resources and you're not gonna have access to talent. So what? You get paid to figure it out, and the way you figure it out is through resourcefulness. They all have that. They all have resourcefulness. There's this wonderful idea, one of these other landisms that we've shared back and forth, that a worthwhile invention has to be startling, unexpected, and must come into a world that is not prepared for it. That's such an amazing sentence. I think the most iconic thing, of course, that Polaroid created was this instant camera. I'd love to now tell the story of that product specifically, because I can't imagine at the time, I'd love you to tell the story of it and set the context, how much of a leap forward that was in lowering the friction, I guess, of taking a photo and receiving the outcome. I don't think anyone was imagining that this could be possible. But very often, these great entrepreneurs start at the end point. What would be the absolute best experience and work backward from that rather than incrementally forward from what's currently possible? Talk about that startling, unexpected nature of 
a worthwhile invention. I'm glad you brought that up. I reread Henry Ford's autobiography. And that book's 100 years old, literally published in 1922. I think people are just like, what's the big deal? He made the Model T. He invented the process. It's not just making a car. It's inventing a process that you can mass produce so people could afford it. Cars at that time, and I'm going to tie this to why people were falling over their chairs when Edwin Land invented instant photography. Cars at that time were luxury items or race cars. If the average person was making two bucks a day, a car would be like six grand. Henry Ford had one idea that took him three decades to actually solve and make which is very similar to Edwin Land's story with instant photography. When he did that, before that, humans got around by horse, horse-drawn carriage, foot, or bicycle. His product literally changed our physical world that you and I inhabit right now. The streets, the suburbs, everything came from this one problem that Henry Ford solved. It was like, how can I make a car so cheap that everybody can use it? And then once everybody uses it, it changes the geography of the United States and the world. Edwin Land, what people don't understand is like, oh yeah, you know, a Polaroid camera, those little square things with the white bottom, what's the big deal? He invented it in 1943, 1946, somewhere in there. The field of photography up until that point had not changed since 1888. What I would say is the difference is like, okay, let's say you and your family pose for a picture. Somebody takes your picture. Back then, it's like, okay, well, how'd that turn out? I don't know. I'll find out in two weeks when I get back from the lab because I have to literally take it out of the camera. I have to mail it to some lab technician. They'll mail it back to me or they'll send it back to me in like two or three weeks. The founding story of the Polaroid camera comes that he's on vacation in New Mexico with his daughter. They're on a walk and... This is what I meant earlier. He's a fully formed person. He's super intense, super driven, super intelligent, but also really articulate, really handsome, really well-dressed, interested in art, interested in photography. So he's taking pictures of his little daughter. I think his daughter's like three or four. She goes, Daddy, why can't I see the pictures now? It stopped him in his track. He's like, first of all, that's a good question. Second of all, why didn't I ask that question? What is wrong with me that I didn't ask the question? And he immediately goes into almost like a hypermanic state. He goes on this walk by himself. And within a few hours, he says he sees the idea in his mind, just like Jobs saw the idea of a personal computer in his mind. It took him many decades to get to. And I would argue the first personal computer was not the Apple II, it wasn't the Mac, it was the iPhone. That's clearly what he was going after for his entire life. He just didn't know what he was going after. He's like, I want a personal computer. Edwin Lane says, I figured out how to do this, except for the parts that took me from 1945 to 1973. He says, you have 10,000 steps. You can go through the first, you know, 9,995. The last five you never get. The last 10% takes all the time. His patent attorney just happens to be on vacation too. After he has this walk and this epiphany in his brain that goes on for a few hours, runs over there and he just starts doing this like data dump onto this guy. This is what I see. This is how I think we'll do it. This is scientific. And then he immediately starts at it. I'm going to go to the presentation, but then I want to go back to the fact that he is 37 at the time, maybe 38. And there's a great line in the book. And it's like, he's achieved everything he wanted in life except success. His company was very close to going out of business up until he invented his way out of the problem. Fast forward, I think it takes him two to three years. Two to three years, they're like, hey, if we don't invent this product and have something that we can sell to the customers, the company's gone. They were living on military contracts because he also invented a ton of stuff. There's a great picture of General Patton on Life magazine. He got super famous. He's wearing Polaroid goggles. Those are an invention of Edwin Land. World War II is over. This contract's going to end. We have nothing else to fulfill. We either invent our way out of this or the company dies. They do it. They invent their way out of it. He goes and gives this presentation. So if people were Google search Edwin Land and you'd go on Google Images, the picture you're going to see is Edwin Land sitting down at a desk, very handsome fellow, like I've said multiple times, in a tie, looking at like an eight by 10. Remember, the first Polaroid is not what we think of, like a little four by four. It's the size of your face. He's peeling off the Polaroid and it shows Edwin Land looking at his face. The reason why it's one of the most famous pictures is because that room is full of press people. This is a huge technological leap in innovation. And that's the first time anybody else outside of Polaroid saw it. When he takes a picture, he's like, listen, I invented a camera that you don't have to wait two or three weeks or a month, whatever, to get them. Show up at this place in New York City. New York Times is there. All these other media outlets are there. There's a ton of photographies. He's like, I'll show it to you. Takes the picture. And he's like, wait 50 seconds. 15 seconds. They're like, oh, what's going on? Is this bullshit? 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 50 seconds. Then he opens it and they go, <gasps> people literally fall over their chairs. They're like, do it again. They thought it was wizardry. That's the point. It's like when you go back and study history, you got to put yourself into how those people thought. Before Henry Ford, if you wanted to get from the farm to the city and it's snowing, guess what? You ain't going anywhere. Even if it's not snowing, you want to walk. Okay, here's a two hour walk. Meanwhile, his car, now it's a 10 minute ride. That changes everything. Same thing. His point is like, okay, why are we waiting for pictures? Now we have the picture, it's right here. And then what happens is they're so close to going out of business, the first time they try to sell the Polaroid camera, they can only make 56 of them. 
this is the crazy thing where I talk about this is an alien. He's talking to the two guys that are going to go to the Jordan Marsh department store in Boston, which is the first place you could ever buy a Polaroid camera. I think they're going the day after Thanksgiving. He's having this conversation on Thanksgiving night. He's asking him, he's like, okay, how many do you think you could sell? We only got 56, but the factory's making more. Our guess is that maybe we sell these 56 by Christmas. We're going to sell 56 over the next month. And Edwin Land's like, I think we can sell 50,000 next year. His employees are like, fuck is wrong with this guy? You're crazy. That's absurd. They go to Jordan Marsh the next day. They open up and they have one demo. And they said, hey, here's this new instant photography camera. It's the first in the world. Take a picture. As soon as people see that demonstration, which he did privately for the press, they elbow each other. They're fighting. Give me, give me, give me. They sell out of all of them within the first few hours. That demo, give me the demo. I'll take that. They don't even have that much film. And then the guy that is running the department store is like, hey, can you guys go get more? It's like, this is all we have. He's like, you're selling them as fast as they come out of the factory? He's like, yeah. And that thing, that demonstration that is happening in the Jordan Marsh in Boston happens. They do it in Miami. They do it everywhere. And the same thing happens every single time. As soon as people see it, just like the first time you saw an iPhone, you're like, oh, this is clearly better than my Motorola Razor that I had. This is not even comparable. It's that kind of thing. It's like, okay, I want one immediately. Talk a little bit more about his development of showmanship over time. Obviously, again, to compare him to Jobs, the Jobs on stage reveals of products are legendary in the history of technology and appointment viewing. When those things happen, I even remember putting on my calendar to be able to watch those reveals. There's something about the combination of the magic of the product that just seems impossible, startling and unexpected to use Land's terms with the just incredible simplicity of the showmanship. We'll put it somewhere on the website or something, but everyone should Google that picture of him peeling back that photo of himself. It would even be impressive somehow today. And that was way back when. Talk about the development of showmanship and what you've learned about the marketing side of Polaroid's history beyond that initial magic and crunch of sales that he created. This is also a larger theme that reappears over and over again. Let's say you could take the almost 300 book biographies of entrepreneurs I've read so far for Founders Podcast. Let's say I could search every single one just to see what name in history appears the most in other books. My best guess is P.T. Barnum, which was shocking to me. Essentially, P.T. Barnum is shorthand. How like Google is now a verb <laughs> instead of a company name. P.T. Barnum is shorthand for like, if you're good at showmanship. It's clear that learning how to sell your product and present it to people is a skill that you can learn. It's very important for entrepreneurs and anybody, like investors, like you're selling stories, narratives, a product, it's all the same stuff. The description of what's happening with that crazy showmanship that me and you were talking about with the picture, let's say 1946, he had been doing stuff like that for decades. And he continued to do stuff in the future. So one of the craziest stories, everybody knows Edwin Land's tulip story. And I was like, what the hell is a tulip story? So I'm reading about it. This is later on. That first camera was sepia and then black and white. But when he saw it in his brain on that walk in New Mexico with his daughter, he saw what our eyes saw. I took a picture in his full color. So it took him 30 years to figure out how to do that. Once he gets to, it's called the SX-70 or SX-72. I should know this. Once he gets it to like its final form, this really beautiful, I actually texted a picture of this to you yesterday. I can't believe this thing was made in the 1970s. It's like a completely foldable, modern looking camera fits in like a big coat pocket. Then it extends out and then you can take a picture and it prints out a full color picture. The fact that they got it down to that size and that thing was available in the 1970s, it still looks like almost futuristic today. So the tulip story is like, okay, well, what are the colors that look best? That's Land's version of the iPhone. Not knowing how to do and working his entire life till. He realized that there's a series of reds and yellows that look really good. So he looks for the flower that's the best in the world that has the colors that will look best on his. He calls some guy in his office and he works for Polar, but it's not like he's a direct report to Edwin Land. He's like, oh man, am I in trouble or something? Shows up in the office and Land goes, you're Dutch, right? And the guy's like, uh, yeah. And he goes... I need 10,000 of these. It might not be 10,000. It's a lot. I can't remember the exact number. And it's a very specific type of tulip. And he goes, I need them and I need them three weeks from now. Go get them. And so the guy immediately flies over to where he's from, like the Netherlands or whatever the case is, basically buys out an entire florist. I don't know what the term is, but basically say, hey, let me just take all the tulips that are in your field. And then he has to rent an entire cargo jet and fly them from Europe to Cambridge to make it in time. This also gets Land in trouble with his board of directors because he would do that all the time. He's like, I'm not in it just for the money, even though he's one of the richest people on the planet at the time. It was excellence for the sake of itself. If I put all this time and energy and love into this product, I need to do that also for the marketing. 
that's jobs. He's like, I want to make the world's best products. And we have to be a great marketing company. We have to learn how to be a great marketing company. That's the only way you get your great products to as many people as possible. That's why Jobs would talk about being impressed by Polaroid's marketing, Sony's marketing, Walt Disney's marketing, Nike, on and on. He took ideas from this and he talked about it over and over again. He was obsessed with being a great marketing company, just like Land was. Where does that come from? And you go back and like Land's probably like 21 and he's going to sell the first successful commercial product Polaroid ever has. There's this giant company, I think it's called American Optics. They probably had like over 50% market share for sunglasses in the United States or maybe the world at the time. And he invents a polarizer. He's not like, oh, look what I did. He's like, hey, three executives from the sunglass company, meet me at this hotel at this time. And he did research where he's like, okay, where's the sun going to be? We have a three o'clock meeting. Where's the sun going to be at that point? And then finding the room where the sun is in the right position. And he brings a goldfish, a small tank full of goldfish, places it right next to the window, does everything perfectly. So when the executives come in the door, they're going to be blinded by the sun through the window because he picked the right room at the right time of day. And they're not going to be able to see the fish. They can't see anything. They walk in the room and his pitch was like really succinct. He's like, hi, gentlemen, I bet you can't even see the fish. And they're like, no, we can't see the fish. And then he drops his polarizer on the outside of the fish tank. And they immediately see the five or six fish or two, whatever, swimming around in there. He goes, that's what your next sunglass is going to be made of. And he signed the contract. They wind up selling like a million, maybe even more. They were called Polaroid day glasses going back to presentation and how it's so important to demonstrate to people what you're doing. What they would do is when they're in stores, these Polaroid day glasses, they were vastly different from any other sunglasses too. So the people in the stores would take the customers outside and they say, those are the glasses you came in with, put these glasses on. They do it and I'll, I'll buy. What do you attribute the ability for them to protect this patent portfolio for so much longer than it's typical, like four decades of protection around what seems like a technology that if you knew how to do it, Ray-Ban could spin up a polarized lens factory and not have to pay the piper. Why were they so successful, maybe on the legal side or something else, in building a fortress patent portfolio and actually protecting it? I'm thinking again about the billion-dollar settlement. This seems like a key part of the business story, and I'm sure Land had his fingers all over this process. What have you learned about that? It seems a singular event in business history. Why did it happen? It's also good to think about this time in history where... It was completely different, and at least in American entrepreneurship. Not only was it expected that you weren't just going to copy what other people are doing, they had a ton of technological optimism, just a belief that the same spirit that causes the Americans to start in the East and move all the way to the West, go out into the pioneering. He's like, that same pioneer spirit is now in a highly intelligent, highly literate, and highly scientific community. You're wasting your time if you're working in an area that you can't patent. Not only do you make your own products, they make the machines to make the products. For Polaroid, the ethos was, built here. That's what he said. He's like, not only are we building our products, we're building the manufacturing methods, we're building the factories. He'd be like, the only thing keeping us alive is our brilliance. And the only way to protect our brilliance is patents. That is our very soul that we're involved in our whole life. There's an entire book that I read about this. It's like 600 pages. It's called A Triumph of Genius, Edwin Land Polaroid and the Kodak Patent War. If I remember correctly, the person writing it was one of the attorneys on the team. But to answer your question, he was obsessed with patents. Every day, they would have a list of what they worked on, and then they'd immediately start patting it. He did it not casually, because the guy doesn't do anything casually. And he did it every day for many decades. Now, what's crazy, and the reason I brought up that book, God forbid anybody else is in a litigation like this. Land's got to go on to testify. He wants to testify. But it is a highly technical and poorly understood field. Highly likely that Edwin Land knows more about the field that he invented than anybody else does on the planet. You knew Kodak was in trouble because essentially the judge is like, yeah, please explain this to me for my edification. And I got to that section. I'm like, oh my God, he's tutoring the judge. She's like, you are the teacher, Edwin, and I am the student. Please teach me what's going on here. So just the level of detail he has and all the stuff that's in his brain. And it was just really intentional. It's like, okay, I know what I'm doing. This was my plan from the get-go. He didn't want a competition. His whole thing is, if I'm not doing anything that somebody else can do, then why are you doing that? He saw Kodak as just a money grab, which again, he has a share with Steve Jobs. You aren't getting into the field to bring some new technological innovation here. You're literally just doing it for money. And he has a funny line. He talks about how inferior the product was. He says this right before the lawsuit. And he's like, this is my version. I've been here for 30 years. That's beautiful. That's elegant. That works. This is your cheap knockoff shitty version. And he was rallying up Polaroid. He goes, so think about it, like you take the picture and then it prints out the picture. He goes, their picture evacuates. Ours ejaculates. <laughs> 
because it's like this slow, weird process. Codex is coming out. It's like eh, making noise and coming out slow. And he goes, mine just comes out like nature intense. <laughs> <laughs> Did a turn of words, didn't he? There's another thing he said, which relates back, I guess, to his motto. Don't do anything someone else can do. He said something like, don't undertake a program unless the goal is important and its achievement is basically impossible. So important and impossible is an interesting combination for like a problem space to focus on. Develop that idea for us a little bit more because I think it speaks a lot to the kind of problems that the most ambitious founders out there today might or should tackle versus let's make a slightly better piece of software for some whatever. It seems like this scope of ambition that Ruloff at Sequoia talks about, always asking founders, tell me about the scope of your ambition. This idea of manifestly important and nearly impossible is really interesting to me. Maybe you could expand on that concept a little bit. His desire was to be great, all the time great, just like Jobs. And Jobs is like, I don't want to be the richest dead person in cemetery. I want Apple to be an organization up there with the greats. I admire the people on Mount Rushmore. I can learn from them, but I can compete with them. And Apple will be an all time great company. So that was his goal. It's not the money. He's like, I'm going to make great products, but to make great products over a long period of time, you have to build an organization that outlives you. Land would do this where he was obsessed with this idea of individual greatness. I'm going to read a quote that I have in front of you. And then I want to tell you, like, he goes back to MIT and to Harvard. They invite him because he's very distinguished and everything else. And he gets up there and saying, your institutions are destroying the individual capacity for greatness. If somebody's truly great and they sit through this curriculum, by the time they get to the end, they're going to think that they can just be merely good. He goes, I think whether outside science or within science, there's no such thing as group originality or group creativity. I do believe wholeheartedly in the individual capacity for greatness. He goes, profundity and originality are attributes of a single, if not singular mind. I want to stop there before I go to his critique of the institutions. And basically, by the time they get out of there, it's like, you could have a bright 18-year-old coming into these institutions. The longer they last in these institutions, the smaller the ambition gets by the end. That's why he was like, I don't care if you're a high school dropout or a college dropout. He never graduated. He had more honorary degrees than anybody else in the country. And he never finished college. First of all, I think this ties to entrepreneurship where they're not run by committee. They're not democracies. You're building a benevolent dictatorship. And hopefully, the product of your benevolent dictatorship is a product that makes someone else's life better. There's a bunch of quotes in these books. These are people that had worked for land for a long time. He's like, make no mistake about it. Polaroid may have 20,000 employees, but it's a one-person company. Even the way he organized this company, where it's almost like how nature, right now on this planet, nature is doing hundreds of trillions of different little decentralized experiments. When he was managing something, he's going to run it. He's not in his office. He's doing experiments. But he wanted you to work on and to experiment with things that were interesting to you. What would happen is, let's say there's two dozen small teams working on different things around things that you're interested in, which is all about instant photography. Once it gets to a point where you need to pull him in, he's not directing that. He knows that science is not directed. It's like, follow whatever you're passionate about, follow what you're willing to work hard on. And then when you think of something that's beneficial, commercially beneficial to our business, bring me in and we'll make sure you get all the resources for it. It's very easy to say, hey, we should be believing in small groups of smart people. If you ask anybody, that makes sense. Have faith, put a lot of resources behind small groups of smart people. Edwin Land, just like Steve Jobs, he actually did that. And it all comes to the fact that his ambition was completely unconstrained. He's a teenager and he's saying, I'm going to be the world's greatest scientist and the world's greatest novelist. That's bizarre. Also realizing that, hey, I'm lucky enough to find something that no one else can do. And then I lock it up in patents to make sure no one else even attempts. And then I just go as deep and as long as possible and realizing that my ambition is so large, I can't do this in five years. I can't do this in 10 years. It's very highly likely that I will die before my true ambition is actually realized. Back to exit strategy being death. There's something else about optimism that pervades his life, his work. I think he even called it a moral duty. Say more about optimism as a moral duty. I think it's a wonderful lesson to take away from him. He just had a fundamental self-belief that you'll figure it out. That's why he would take art history graduates. He was hiring women scientists. They call them the Polaroid princesses, I think is the term. I know he's building a giant company, but his whole thing is individual greatness. He's like, if an individual is truly interested and truly wants to do something, no one will be able to stop them. A lot of those people are not going to start their own companies. So if you can find and identify those people like he did, and a lot of them is undiscovered talent, then just get out of their way. We talked about this on Invest Like the Best. Pessimists never make anything. Optimists are the ones where, yeah, they're going to have a lot more failures than pessimists because pessimists are just sitting on the couch and not even getting to the line. My understanding of the way Edwin Land thought was optimism is a moral duty, but he also has another maxim where he's like, if you could state a problem, then it can be solved. 
you talk to a normal person and you say that, they think, my life is difficult. Well, I got a bad roll of dice. They think life is something that happens to them, where Edwin Land thought life is something to be shaped by you. Your optimism is what should drive you. I think I can make the world a better place. And the way he did it is by inventing products that make people's lives better. And he talks a lot about, hey, think about the intimacy of a family has. It changes human behavior. Now you're at a party, maybe with your family, and you're taking pictures. And now because you can see the picture, now you're gathering around and you guys are laughing. And there's just this emotional human element. He invented what Jobs did. Land said it first. He's like, I want to build a company at the intersection of technology and liberal arts. There has to be a humanness to this. And so the products I'm making should increase the humanness, the connection between ourselves and make their lives better. Optimism, I think, is a way to drive that. And then also realizing, hey, problems are just opportunities and we're close. This is very interesting because this gets into the finances of Polaroid, which we haven't discussed yet. They have monopolistic products because no one can compete with them. On a pack of Polaroid film, I bought your amazing camera, Edwin. Thank you very much. Now he's got this reoccurring revenue because it doesn't come with unlimited film. Polaroid is the world's first film where you could take pictures and it's not going to be seen by another person first. The profit margin on a pack of film for Polaroid at this point was 60%. Software level profit margins. They're like, damn, we're selling a lot of film. People are taking a lot of pictures. The first big market was people taking naughty pictures with their lover. It always starts with porn. <laughs> Technology and porn are a tale as old as time. It winds up being this underground Polaroid pornography industry because they're taking pictures with it and then they sell it to other people. They knew that was happening. It makes sense. They didn't advertise for it. Clearly, people are like, oh, I can now take a picture. And that weird lab technician isn't getting off on it. What's fascinating is I read a book on Evan Spiegel, founder of Snapchat. The book focused on right before Snapchat was invented and then right after Snapchat was invented. And you read in that book, it says Evan keeps talking about his heroes. My two heroes are Steve Jobs and Edwin Land. And I pause right there. I'm like, first of all, how the hell does a 21-year-old kid even know who Edwin Land is? Another young guy saying, hey, I'm on the forefront of technology, but if I study all the great entrepreneurs before me, I can combine all the stuff they knew with this area of technology I'm in, the combination that's going to make my product and the businesses that I build in the future even better. In that book, Evan's like, everybody thought I was building another social network or an app. He's like, I'm building a camera company, just like my hero, Edwin Land. If you think about it, what is the first use case of Snapchat? To take naughty pictures that no one else sees and can keep. What it made me think of was, if you were Edwin Land today, you wouldn't invent the physical camera. It's highly likely he'd be working in some kind of software, that kind of technology. He would probably make hardware too. But I was like, oh, that's fascinating where Evan is taking an idea that happened in the 1940s, and he's applying that to college kids. There is some weird thing in human nature. You go back, you could see paintings and art 5,000 years ago, and the people were naked. They might be joining their bodies together in a loving way. It's like, okay, for the exact same people, it's like, oh, if I'm going to do this, I'll take a picture and I'll save it for later. I just love how these things connect. I love it. I think there's probably something also to be learned about the aftermath of Polaroid after Land's death. You said something before we went on mic about the idea of Apple in the era when he was gone between his two stints at Apple and what happened to Apple and how similar that was to what happened to Polaroid. I'm thinking back to your enlightened despotism of some of these great entrepreneurial leaders. Talk a bit about what happened to Polaroid after he died and why and what lessons we can glean from that looking forward. There's a human nature lesson here, too. This guy has been knocking it out of the park for like six decades. You're not only more driven than anybody else around you, your record is, at this point, now he's close to seven years old. It's just amazing. You've invented entire new industries. Every product you put out, people love it. Eventually, the problem is, of course I'm right. I assume that I'm right. So he invents something called the Polavision, which is maybe late 1970s, early 1980s, sometime around there. This is the rise of like the home video camcorder thing. He actually is friends with Sony's founder, Akio Morita. Land does this great breakthrough, but he's too late. So he makes... And people can Google Polavision. You can actually see this thing. It's kind of cool looking for the time, but it's a handheld way to make videos. But the videos are only three minutes long and they have no sound. And it had been in development for decades. Polaroid writes off, I think the official write-off they do is $68 million on this project. But they're like, the accounting is funny. Highly likely it was $500 million. <laughs> He's not trying to make money. He's just like, okay, I got the money. Let's throw that back in. He just wants to make great products. When that happens, the board starts to try to push him out. He was CEO, president, chairman, head of research and science. He get like 17 titles. And they're like, Edwin, you got to give Bill, this guy, Bill McCune, 
presidency. You got to give him one of your things. The stock was having trouble at the time, so he felt pressure and he did that. Bill was more like a John Scully kind of person. He was way more technical than Scully, so it's not the perfect analogy. But his whole thing is, let's diversify. And that's where Edwin has that quote where I just said earlier, it's like, we're on the 90-yard line. The next guy's 30 yards back and he tells us to diversify. This is what Steve Jobs noticed because Scully and Jobs met Land. After Land left Polaroid, he had this thing called the Roland Institute of Science. That's where Jobs and Scully met him. And they're leaving. And Jobs is like, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. They took a company of a truly great man away for blowing a lousy couple million dollars, not realizing that three years after Jobs saying that Scully's going to do that to him. The analogy there is, we all know that Jobs gets kicked out of 30, has his wilderness years for 12 or 13 years, comes back. When he comes back to Apple, it's on the precipice of bankruptcy. It's not doing well. I've read 12 books about Jobs. Some people say that was overstated. Some saying, no, it would happen in a few weeks, but it's not doing well. We know that for a fact. What happened to Polaroid is land leaves. They try to diversify. And it's also like they started to have digital cameras and they started having camcorders. His main innovation was that you can get the picture right away and it looks good. Now you're having, why would you need a Polaroid camera? Me and you don't use Polaroid cameras. We take picture every day with our iPhone. What's crazy in the 1970s, there's a video you can find, and I've read the entire script where Land just sits there unscripted and just goes, eventually the camera is going to be something. He holds up something that looks like an iPhone, but it's not an iPhone. It's going to be something you carry on you. You can put it in your pocket. You're going to keep it all day long. You're not going to take two pictures. You're going to take hundreds every day. He's describing 1970, the smartphone. So what happens is he has another idea after Polavision fails, but now he has to go to Bill to get funding. I forgot what it was, maybe $50 million. I have a project. I want to do it. Bill's like, I'm not funding it. And Edwin's like, if you don't fund it, I'll leave. And Bill says, that's fine. Edwin Land leaves his company. It's heartbreaking. He gave his entire life to it. If that happened to me, I'd probably jump off a bridge the next day. He continues. He's still in poor health and he lives for another seven, eight years. Bill doesn't have a product genius. So he's just like, okay, we'll build printers or we'll build Xerox or we'll build film or we'll do all this other stuff that we have really no advantage. Exactly Apple after Steve Jobs left. You go look at their very confused product lines. It's like, oh, what's that technology company doing? Okay, we'll just do that too, but in a slightly different way. It goes down rapidly. So you have the loss of the in-house genius and you have this rise of digital cameras and everything. And it was fast, less than a decade, I think. Even if they're not bankrupt, they're starving off bankruptcy. And then they're selling off factories. Remember, they also had a huge physical infrastructure. It's not like a lot of the companies that exist in America today. They were making their own film. They had this huge campus they had to pay for. And that just one by one, okay, I'll sell off your foot and maybe that'll work. No, that didn't work. Okay, I need the leg. Give me the leg. It's like that old Monty Python thing where it's like, then you just have a torso. They just cut it off. And by that time, it was over. But they have a cult following. So that's why the book that I'm holding in my hand, The Story of Polaroid, it talks about the impossible project. Essentially, like people had bought the assets of Polaroid, try to keep it alive, and then they resold it. It's gone through all these different manifestations today. It is still a brand that exists today, but it's half of 1% of what it was. If you were to affix that picture that we talked about earlier of Land's first demonstration of the Polaroid process in your office, above your desk, whatever, and you were to see it first thing each morning, what's going through your head as you see that picture? If we had to sum up this discussion on Land and Polaroid, what boiled down, does he and it and the story most represent to you that you find useful for your life and you think other founders might find useful for theirs? He like changed the trajectory of my life. I was working on two things at the time. I was working on a founder's podcast and I had this other idea. It was podcast notes for entrepreneurs. We all listen to a lot of the same podcasts. There's a lot of valuable information in these podcasts. There's no possible way you can listen to all of them. We should hire somebody to take notes. And then we're just on a giant email list. And it's like, there's 10 podcasts we listen to. Here's the 10 notes. It's still a good idea. So much so that people were paying me to do it every year. But when I heard Edwin Land said, don't do anything somebody else can do, I realized somebody else can do that. But nobody can do founders the way I can do it. The second thing is this guy will not shut up about the importance of focus and concentration. There's a line, it says among all of Land's intellectual arsenal, which was huge, the chief asset seems to just be simple concentration. He would go around saying, hey, my whole life has been spent trying to teach people that intense concentration for hour after hour can bring out in people resources they didn't know they had. So I was like, okay, I'm going to only do what I can do. I'm going to concentrate completely on it. And then he's got another great line. There's something they don't teach you at Harvard Business School. And that's anything worth doing is worth overdoing. But even those three ideas is just don't do something anybody else can do. Do something that's uniquely you. Make sure your personality's in it. Anyone that's personality is Polaroid writ large. Concentrate on it. 
and then take it further than anybody else possibly would. And if you do that over a long period of time, you'll get everything out of life that you want. It's an absolutely perfect place to close. Like so many people that you've tried to change this for, I didn't know anything about Edwin Land. I had that book, the one where he's sitting in the chair and the dark cover, I can't remember the title of it. Triumph of Genius. I had that book, I never read it. I didn't know anything about him, I obviously knew Polaroid. And I feel like we're missing. We're missing one of the great exemplars of the entrepreneurial spirit from our common history. So hopefully this episode will begin to help change that. I know obviously you've already done that a lot for people. Perfect place to close on a fascinating human and business through time. David, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. To find more episodes of breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 